Now that we've observed and inspected the patient from different views, we're moving on to active range of motion. Now things to consider when assessing active range of motion would be the fluidity of movement, is the patient controlled, are they guarding, uh, is there symmetry from one side to another. And a big indicator of helping you kind of figure out what's going on in terms of the clinical assessment is, is it painful? Making a note of where pain begins, where it ends, and at what level. So when looking at active range of motion, it's really a fundamental step that will allow you to move forward with the other aspects of this examination. So first off, we'll assess lumbar flexion. So we've got Lindsay here. What I want you to do is place your hands just on the front of your legs, just let them rest. And I want you to bend at the waist here and let the arms slowly kind of run down the front, perfect. So as Lindsay's doing this, we're looking at the lumbar spine and we're trying to see where's the flexion occurring. Is it in her low back? Is it in her hips? Or is she compensating perhaps with more movement in the upper back? Something to look for is if the knees are bent, that could be indicative of tight hamstrings. In terms of musculature, the rectus abdominis, the obliques, and the hip flexors are creating this movement. But eccentrically, on the opposite side, we've got the erector spinae resisting that movement. So normal ranges would be between 40 and 60 degrees of flexion. So once again, we're looking for symmetry and ease of movement as well. Okay, and you can come back. One thing to note is disc pathologies do not like flexion. So as Lindsay was bending forward, if there were a disc issue or a nerve root issue, that would exacerbate symptoms. On the flip side, if she were to extend, um, the facets would be involved. So if there's a facet pathology, you'd actually see an improvement in the condition as the patient flexes forward. So that's something to keep in mind as you observe range of motion. Now that we've looked at flexion, we're moving on to extension. So what I'd like you to do is uh, place your hands on your hips, okay, and then you're gonna arch back as far as you comfortably can. So ranges that we're looking for here would be between 20 and 35 degrees. Conditions that do not like extension would be uh, facet joint problems, osteoarthritis, degeneration of the spine, especially stenosis. Uh, I'm gonna to walk to the other side here for a sec. Something that you want to observe, actually go back to a straight position. Okay, and now come back into extension again. So as Lindsay's doing this, what we want to see is the synergy between her, her pelvis and hips and her low back. They should work together. Try to see if a patient is hinging or perhaps compensating by either moving too far into extension or using their hips to compensate for lack of mobility here. And the primary muscles creating this motion here would be the extensor spinae. Okay, or the erector spinae, I should say, correct myself. Great, okay, and come back, yeah. Now we'll look at lateral flexion. So we're gonna test both sides. What I want you to do, Lindsay, is you're gonna rest your hands on your sides and you're just gonna run one hand down, perfect, yeah. And then come back to the other side. So what we're observing here is we're going to compare left and right. One thing to note is if there is an issue in this area, patients will try to compensate. So just do that again. Uh, so run the right hand down. What might, you might see is someone actually rotating forward or flexing forward, and that's not what we want to see. We want to make sure they stay in that plane of motion. So come back to the other side. Perfect. So observing Lindsay with, um, let's go left lateral flexion. In this position, what's happening is we're getting compression of the ipsilateral facet joints. So if there's an issue there, this will cause a reaction or maybe localized pain. If the contralateral muscles, the quadratus lumborum, for example, or erector spinae are involved, this eccentric contraction may elicit uh, a painful response if there were a strain, or if there's too much muscle activity, maybe hypertonic QL, obliques, or erector spinae on this side, that could also elicit a problem. Okay, and come back to neutral. Perfect. So that's definitely what you want to observe, remembering that on the side of flexion, structures are compressing versus on the opposite side, you're actually getting eccentric contractions or opening up of joints. And now lastly, we'll look at rotation. One thing to really think about in terms of rotation is that the majority of rotation actually occurs in the thoracic spine. 
because of the orientation of the facet joints in the lumbar spine, it actually will limit movement more in the sagittal plane, meaning more flexion and extension. So to give you an example, I'll just have you um, keep the feet planted and just try to turn your body to one side and then to the other side. So yeah, so good, yeah, and try to rotate as far as you comfortably can. So as you can see, as Lindsay's doing this, it's not limited to this part of her spine. There's movement in her hips, literally down from her feet all the way up to her torso, including her shoulders. So rotation is a fairly complex motion, but it's one that you definitely have to observe as part of this examination. Change is gonna come for me If I just say